microphone that works. We're in good shape. All righty. New moon. What time's the moon going to show up? Mark, Mark walked out when I asked that. Because Mark's the only one that knows those things. When? 6.42 is when sunset is. Okay. So I wanted to start at 6. About the time we're done, uh, we should be able to go out there and sight it. <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, time we have together on uh, the beginning of, uh, of your month according to Scripture. We uh, pray, Father, that uh, we, we take your, your word as truth and, and understand that the world today is very confused. We, uh, we also pray today for peace in Jerusalem and Israel. We pray for your people who you, you're bringing back together. Uh, and we pray for your will to be done. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. <coughs> okay, um, something I hadn't mentioned to anybody yet. Um, just uh, tomorrow, and I've been doing it today, I'm going to do a little fasting and prayer time for uh, peace in Israel. So if anybody wants to do that, feel free. Uh, understanding that I have a little, quite a bit more reserve set up for a fast than maybe the average person. So... Uh, and it won't hurt me any to go without a little bit of food and probably go without some other things I enjoy. So, what the heck? And I don't mean cigars this time. So, <clears throat> so if anybody wants to do that, I would, I would uh, welcome it and encourage it. So, some in my family are. Well, uh, this is part three of creation versus evolutionism. And I always add the ism in the back of uh, evolution because it is an ism. It's a, it's a cultic type belief that requires so much leaps of faith that it's, uh, it's, rather, it's rather funny. I saw a video last night. I watched it on uh, a guy that is talking against what's called Torahism. And I thought, well, that's interesting. What's that? That's us. About the, the dangers of Torahism. So they're putting an ism behind us. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. And uh, I, I would love to the, do a counter thing with the guy. If we can ever figure out how to play his stupid video and me interrupt it and then go back to it without it being clumsy, we'll do that. Um, but lawlessism, I think, is what has corrupted people, not obeying the Torah. And that's where the ism is, is in the lawlessness. And he came up with the same old stupid stuff. Uh, and he's an expert, though. You know, he's an expert. Uh, that means he's a preacher from out of town. So, okay, going back to the creation versus evolutionism stuff here. Um, it's just various textbooks that, are, that our children have learned from. And actually, now we're getting to where it's grandchildren that are learning from these because um, I, I hadn't done this. Last time I did this was in 07. So that's years ago. And did I update it? No, I'm not going to go back and look at a new... See what's in the newer textbooks? It's the same stuff over and over and over again. Nothing's changed. Nothing new. There's nothing new under the, uh, under the banner of evolutionism. And this is the one when my kids were in high school, the ones that they were uh, in junior high, the ones they used. <clears throat> uh, and when we're going to go over these lies, the first few we've kind of been over already, uh, so I'll, kind of, I'll, I'll bump through them, but there were lies in textbooks that's, that are, that's being pushed to the children pushed on them, and um, I want to go ahead and cover them again just briefly. Um, line number one is that river did not make that canyon, and they do teach that in textbooks uh, where it says over millions of years a Colorado River has carved out the Grand Canyon from solid rock. No, it did not. Uh, you see, the fact that it exists um, is one thing, but their interpretation is not, they're not facts. Different interpretations uh, our, our way of looking at facts. Now, according to Scripture, it was formed quickly by lots of water over a little time, and their interpretation is it's formed slowly by a little water over a lot of time. <clears throat> um, the earth has layers of sedimentary rock that they say has formed slowly over millions of years, and we say uh, are formed from the flood of Noah. Um, evolutionists are always trying to erase that line between their interpretation and the facts, and that's not true. It's, it's ridiculous. And we talked about this before. The Colorado River is, is flowing downhill. How did it j jump up um, 
4,000 to, to 6,000 feet up in the air to start carving out that Grand Canyon. It's impossible. It's ridiculous. Okay, the, the, the water is just going to keep flowing downhill. Uh, and if anything, it's just going to flow around that big mound. It's not going to jump up on top of it and start carving it out. <clears throat> uh, if a dam were built upon, uh, across Grand Canyon, a large lake would form. And that's what happened, by the way. That's how the canyon was formed. It was a dam that was formed there naturally, probably after the flood of Noah. And then a large storm breached that dam. And then that left behind what we know today to be the Grand Canyon. And by the way, geologists will admit this. Uh, natural geologists will admit this. That that's, I have a buddy of mine who is a good Christian. He denies the flood of Noah. Um, so he's a good Christian. Uh, he's a geologist. He has a, a degree in geology. And he says, yeah, that's how it was formed. Okay, well, good. We know that river didn't form that, right? Right. Okay, we agree on something. <clears throat> and that's that uh, Kebab uplift there. It's just that one big part there that's, that's raised up. And it used to be a big lake that was there. And it got breached. And they, they go by uh, something called uniformitarianism. That's a geological doctrine that existing processes acting in the same manner at the present are sufficient to account for all geological changes. So everything that you see today in you know, Arkansas getting 42 inches of rainfall a year has been that way for 360 million years. Okay, and that formed what we have today. That's simply not true. It's simply not true. Um, you can explain the... the the, uh, the landforms that we see today much better with a flood, by the way, uh, a worldwide flood. I think I mentioned to you that all the, all the land masses that we have within 14 million years will, be, years will be eroded into the oceans, within 14 million years. But we find fossils that are allegedly 100 million years old. How is that possible? It's not. It's not. Everything should be washed away into the ocean. Especially if uniformitarianism were true. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. This is Second Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Uniformitarianism. Every, nothing's changed ever since the beginning. Verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of Elohim the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So people would deny the flood happened, although the evidence is all around us, and he was right there. Uh, here's line number two, is that geologic column. The geologic column does not exist. We talked about that a little bit. Um, they claim the geologic column shows billions of years of Earth history. The geologic column in its entirety has never been found anywhere on the Earth. It's never been found. The same minerals, rocks, sandstones, limestones, etc., exist in all layers of the geologic column. There's no difference in the composition of any layer from another. You see a layer of sandstone, sandstone they say is from the Jurassic layer, is exactly the same type of sandstone you find in layers that are 100 million years allegedly older. Same stuff exactly. Same exact stuff, no difference. The layers of the geologic column are dated by the fossils that are found in the layers. And the fossils are dated by the layer they're found in. So you get your Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Carboniferous. I like the Carboniferous one. That sounds a little uh, studious to me. Devonian, Silurian, Ordovician, and Cambrian. Uh, in the early 1800s, each layer of rock was given a name. And that's what happened in the 1800s, and an age and an index fossil. Um, the strata are dated by the fossils, and the fossils are dated by the strata. You see, that's how that works. You can't go wrong if you do it that way. You can't go right either, but... <laughs> Geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionists. Uh, the only place it's ever found, though, are in the textbooks. That's the only place it's ever found. You don't find it any place else, just in the textbooks. Uh, this, if there were a column of sediments to probably continuously, unfortunately, no such column exists. Well, that's, that's an admission there. It's not really there. Um, 
You know where, uh, you see your limestone layers? They're all the same. They're exactly all the same. Polystrate fossils, we talked about that, extending through multiple layers, proved the geologic column to be false. We have examples of that, many examples. Uh, index fossils are used to date the geologic layers. Well, there's no such thing as an index fossil, all right? That one only existed during the, the, pre, the Cambrian era. No, it's, <laughs> it's not really the case. Um, how do you tell the difference between a 100 million year old Jurassic limestone and 600 million years of old Cambrian limestone? How do you tell the difference? You know how you tell the difference? It is by the index fossils that are there. Well, here's an interesting one, uh, trilobites. You've heard about trilobites. They, uh, uh, this one was in a rock layer probably 500 to 600 million years ago. Okay, which is, uh, oh, that's a long time. Uh, then you find a smashed trilobite in a footprint. It was put down by a shoe. That's an old shoe now. It's an old, old shoe. I've got a pair of shoes, might be about that old. Won't, wife, I won't let my wife throw them away. Um, to look at that little smashed feller in there. <clears throat> Oh, it's in Cambrian shale, so that's 600 million years old, you understand. Uh -uh. Um, trilobites have the most sophisticated eye lenses ever produced by nature. Well, how'd they have that 600 million years? How do you start out with, as a creature that supposedly evolved into something else and something else and something else over millions, hundreds of millions of years, but you start out with the most sophisticated eye lenses ever produced by nature? How do you start out that way? by evolutionary theory. The eyes of early trilobites have never been exceeded in complexity or acuity. Huh. Well, I'll be darned. Trilobite fossils make good index fossils. If a trilobite such as this one is found in a rock layer, the rock layer was probably formed five to 600 million years ago. Uh, not unlike a horseshoe crab, too, if you uh, have seen those. Um, possibly a living trilobite, a deep sea isopod. Crustaceans are found in the coastal waters of Florida and Mexico. Mount Blanco Museum, 35 miles east of Lubbock, has a great display of fossil trilobites. Huh. Uh, they're graptolites, they're index fossils. Uh, they're 410 million years old, by the way. Um, but they're still found alive in the South Pacific. Boy, huh. Uh, so much for that index fossil. The coelacanth. Let's, don't, you see that fish right there? He is 325 million years old. Did you know that? That's an old fish. Uh, that was an index fossil for a, a certain period until they found him living. And the thing is, just, here's the problem. They just live deep in the ocean. They just have a, the only, the only place they live is way deep, hundreds of feet deep. So, and, and they have adapted to that. So when the flood happened, where, how, where are they going to be buried? Way deep, right? Because that's where they are in the water. Uh, more coelacanths. You'll be taught that dinosaurs lived over 70 million years. And this whole thing here about <laughs> dinosaur blood found inside a dinosaur bone. Now, 70 million year old blood. Uh, gee, uh, that's impossible. Scientists from Montana State University seemingly struggling to allow professional caution to restrain their obvious excitement at the findings. Report on the evidence which seems to strongly suggest the traces of real blood from a T-Rex have actually been found. The story starts with a beautifully preserved T-Rex skeleton unearthed in the United States in 1990. When the bones were brought to the Montana State University's lab, it was noticed that some parts deep inside the long bone of the leg had not completely fossilized. Over 70 million years? So the arrow points to tissue fragments, still elastic. Uh, another instance of fresh appearance B, which similarly makes it hard to believe in millions of years. Um, regions of bone in C there, showing where fibrous structure is still present compared to most fossil bones, which lack this structure. Uh, but these bones are claimed to be 65 million to years old but they maintain this structure like that, that soft structure. 18 million year old magnolia leaves from an Idaho shale were still green 
when the rock was first cracked open. Huh, still green. Fossil bees, allegedly 25 million years old, contain ancient germinating bacteria in their abdomens. Huh. Amazing. Uh, you forget about the millions of years of nonsense. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's mythical. But that's, uh, that's, their, uh, that's their magic sauce, is time. Okay? Well, now, I don't see how this could... I don't know how we developed from, a, from pond scum into what we are now. Well, you just don't put enough magic sauce in it. Okay? Put more magic sauce in it and take it back millions of years further in your imagination. And there it is. <clears throat> Evolution can be defined as a change in species over time. That is lie number four. This is not what they really mean by evolution. <clears throat> the word evolution has two very different meanings. It's macroevolution and microevolution. Microevolution is um, from the canine kind. A lot of dogs came from that, and wolves and foxes and coyotes. Okay? Now, macroevolution says we all came from a rock. All right? And they say all you have to do is expound upon the canine kind turning into dogs and, and wolves and coyotes. Just let more time go by, earlier and earlier, and you'll see that we all came from a rock. No. No, that's not true. It's silly. It's stupid. Uh, us and dogs and roses all came from a rock, and that's our common ancestor. Um, now, microevolution is observed. Scientific, it's scriptural. Uh, macroevolution, it is assumed. It's religious. It's unscriptural. <clears throat> Fantasy based on imagination is all it is. Teachers often give students evidence of microevolution to try and get them to believe in macroevolution. You see, in, uh, for instance, in microevolution with the dogs and the coyotes and so forth, all the, all the information to make these different types of canines is already in the canine DNA. It's all there. But the canine DNA doesn't have anything that can turn it into a rose or make it grow feathers. There's nothing in the DNA to do that. You can't remix it, shake it upside down, stir it up with a stick. You can't, nothing you can do to make these things appear. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> but that's the bait and switch type of thing they do. Students are given one definition of the word evolution, like descent with modification, which is true. You know, if you're talking about a canine kind and how we get chihuahuas and Great Danes out of both of those, uh, to get them to start believing it, and then the switch begins. The word evolution has many meanings, only one of which is scientific. Uh, cosmic evolution, which is the origin of time, space, and matter, the Big Bang. Uh, chemical evolution, the origin of higher elements from hydrogen. Do you realize they claim that everything came from hydrogen gas? Everything? Uh, I've never seen hydrogen gas turn into anything but hydrogen gas. Uh, there's stellar and planetary evolution, the origin of stars and planets. There's organic evolution, the alleged origin of life. There's macroevolution, the alleged origin of major kinds. Then there's microevolution, vari variations within kinds, the only one that's been observed. The others are science fiction, Steven Spielberg type, werewolf movie nonsense. The real meaning of evolution is slipped in as students continue to be educated. They're being led to believe that the Big Bang uh, cosmic evolution, organic evolution, etc., are also parts of evolutionary theory. And if they object, they're told they don't understand science. Now, what were you told when you said, uh, I don't want to take the jab? What did they tell you? You don't understand what? Science. Same argument. Same nonsense. Same religious philosophy from the same priests of their cult. Okay? Don't buy it. Don't buy it. In advertising, this illegal procedure is called bait and switch. You want that new Mercedes for 10 bucks? Come and get it. Whoop, sold out of those. How about this one for half a million? Okay, buy it. Some evolutionists claim that macroevolution, just microevolution for longer time periods. Uh, it's dreaming. No one's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog, and it won't. It can't. The DNA molecule doesn't allow for it. You have to imagine that it happened a long, long time ago in a land far, far away with R2-D2 and everything 
and you'll have the true story. This is religion, it's not science. There are genetic barriers to prevent it from happening. What would a partly evolved dog marry? What would it mate with? Uh, a Democrat. <laughs> How would intermediate forms live? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just... Variations do happen, but they have limits. Farmers breed for bigger pigs, but they'll never get a pig as big as Texas. It won't happen. Roaches become re resistant to pesticides, but not to hammers. So there's limits, there's limits. They produce the same kind of animal. That's not evolution. The information for the variation is already present. No new information is added. The dogs don't become pink or learn to fly. The gene pool of the new variety is more limited than before and less able to adapt to future changes. For instance, chihuahuas cannot produce Great Danes. How long would a chihuahua last in the real world? All it has to do is gnaw on the heel of the wrong person or creature and it's done. <clears throat> but this is how, you know, they break down, you know, family, species, genus, and, and all these different things that are, may or may not be true. Um, <clears throat> the method of evolution in which a variety of species evolved from a common ancestor is called adaptive radiation or divergent evolution. This is a way in which all modern domestic dogs have evolved from ancestral wolves. Divergent evolution. No, it's still a dog. It's a dog. It's a dog. And we have dogs and cats. Okay? Now, if evolution were true, and they all had a common ancestor. Why do we have separate dogs and cats? Why wouldn't we have a lot of cogs and dats in between? Why wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? It makes sense that we would, but we don't. <clears throat> in 1 Timothy 6, verses 20 and 21, O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Adolf Hitler said, let me control the textbooks and I'll control the state. Huh. But they learned from, the, from the, an expert, there's no doubt about that. Um, E.O. Wilson, he, said, he wrote, as, there, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with a great fervor and interest in fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and I heard about the evolutionary theory. Um, so he's an evol evolutionary entomologist and sociobiologist at Harvard for over 30 years. Well, it's a fancy names for really uh, pathetic uh, things to major in, really pathetic majors, where you learn absolutely nothing. Um, you see, he, he, he majored in evolutionary entomology and sociobiology because lesbian dance theory was not an option when he was there. F Philip E. Wentworth, when I entered Harvard in the fall of 1924, I was not only a Christian, I was also an avowed candidate for the ministry. And he goes on to say in the end, I gave up the ministry because uh, evolutionism was just too overwhelming for him. Just too overwhelming. 75% of all children raised in Christian homes will attend public schools who will reject the Christian faith by their first year of college. Interesting. Hmm. <clears throat> Natural selection can act only on those biologic properties that already exist. It cannot create properties in order to meet adaptational needs. And that's just a fact. Lie number five, natural selection does not cause evolutionism. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Mutations make something new. We talked about that. Those are just accidental keystrokes in the coding. Uh, damages in the coding. Natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. See, that's, that's just simply not true. The startling fact that most species remain recognizably themselves, virtually unchanged throughout their occurrence in genealogical sediments of various ages. Things don't really change that much. <clears throat> um, there in the book, in the textbook, it says, organisms do not anticipate the future to produce mutations that may be of later value. 
And it says, mutations are the original source of variation in populations, as shown by many, many varieties of roses available. But they're all still roses. Okay? They're all still roses. No matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not provide any kind of evolution. Pierre Paul Grass admitted that. They rearrange existing information, but do not increase genetic complexity. That is the problem with evolutionism. There is no mechanism for the DNA molecule to gather new information in, to arrange it in a proper way, and then to enable it to be beneficial to the organism. There is no mechanism for these things. There is no mechanism. Nothing to do that with. What we have are as a DNA molecules, which are highly, highly complex, that have slowly been deteriorating over time. Which one is science? The highly complex that was already created that's now deteriorating. That follows science. Evolutionism does not. You got a five-legged bull. Is that an improvement? Is that a better bull now? Is he faster, stronger? No. No. No new information added, just some stuff scrambled up in there. Um, there's uh, some, a mini sheep, got some little legs. No new, no new information added, just a loss of information. Uh, so not, not good for the turtle. Not good for the turtle to have two heads. From the letters in the word Christmas, you can get the following. Hazmat, Sam, Christ, Ram, Sat, Hit, etc. But you can't get Xerox, Zebra, or Queen. Why? Because the information's not there. The letters aren't there. <clears throat> See, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. It's a rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. There aren't any. There aren't any. If you say it is, why not give an example? Why not give an example? You know why they can't? Because there aren't any. There aren't any. I told you the one that they try and give you, sickle cell anemia. There, there's your beneficial mutation. Thanks, but no thanks. Well, if you live in an area that where malaria is prevalent, it's a good thing to have. Well, it's going to kill you. Um, yeah, okay, malaria, the receptor that malaria attaches to is destroyed. Something to that effect. Okay, I understand that. Um, but that's not a good thing. And that damage was also done to the DNA molecule. The damage was done. There was damage done. Now, whether or not that helped, it's kind of a moot point. It still deteriorated, da more damaged DNA, period. Period, period. Natural selection, how natural selection causes evolutionism. Your large brain, the color of your skin, and numerous other characteristics are a result of evolution by natural selection. Oh, <laughs> please. <clears throat> Creationists have no argument with natural selection. We thought of it first. It's only a conservative process that removes defective organisms and keep the species strong. Well, sure. If you get uh, bad genetics in a certain part of your population and they die off, well, then those that don't have that, then the, the, the perpetuating the species will not have that particular uh, issue any longer. <clears throat> okay. Did you ever hear about the peppered moths? The peppered moth uh, proof of evolutionism? Um, that was line number six. <laughs> it was proved to be falsified, phony stuff. Here's, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you about it. Uh, <clears throat> this, this guy did an experiment. Um, it's during the industrial age. And due to the, and, and he said now, the uh, moths that were light colored would land on trees um, and since the, the pollution wasn't as bad, they couldn't be seen, and the predators didn't eat those. They only ate the dark-colored moths. However, when the Industrial Revolution kicked in and the lichens and everything stuck to the trees and darkened the tree bark, the dark moth population exceeded and the light moth population decreased greatly. There's a study he did, okay? See, it proves evolutionism. It means we all came from Iraq. See? Proved it. We're all rearranged pond scum. Well, <laughs> they had it in my kid's textbook. Had it right there, your peppered moth thing. Um, here's the conclusions from that. Moth population ratio shifted 
from mostly white to mostly black as trees turn black. Moth population was able to adapt to the new environment. This type of change through, through adaptation dev demonstrates evolution in action. All right? Uh, here's some problems with that. If this experiment were true, it would only show how moths change color, not how their new life forms emerge. By the way, peppered moths are nocturnal. What does that mean? They don't come out during the day. <laughs> they only come out at night. So what the heck difference does it make what color they are? Okay? The whole study was a fraud. <laughs> the guy made it all up. The numbers were faked. The study was never performed. Ah, here we go. See, but if you want your kids to learn something, here's what you do. This is an activity. Get a black sheet of paper and get some and cut out some black circles and some white circles and let's see which ones show up better. Oh, please. This is a, there's other problems with the kettle well story here. Uh, the moths, peppered moths, they don't rest on tree trunks. <laughs> Exactly two moths have been seen on tree trunks in 40 years. Kettlewell actually glued two dead moths to the tree trunk to make his famous photograph. He glued two dead moths to the tree trunk. Uh, moths have no tendency to choose matching backgrounds either. Huh. Kettlewell's results have not been replicated in later studies, by the way. The shift in moth population did occur, but took place well before the lichens grew on polluted trees. A parallel shift in moth population occurred in the U.S. industrial areas, but there was no change in lichens. So anyway, it was all fraud, all fake. But it's in the textbooks. It's in the textbooks. Um, there's another one. Comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolutionism. Um, as you observe here, each animal in figure 12.3, we'll look at that in a second, has a four-limb structure that's a variation of a common pattern. The commonality suggests that these are other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. Line number seven. This provides, uh, proves a common designer. Uh, no, it does not. There's evidence from structure in that biology book. This is called evidence from homology. So you take a human arm and a cat leg and a whale fin and a horse leg and a bat wing. See how they're all the same thing? See, they haven't got them color-coded for you. I wonder if uh, they're color-coded when you... Look at them there, I don't think so. Um, yeah, you can't hardly tell the difference between a human arm and a cat leg, can you? Well, that's impossible to tell them apart, isn't it? Um, that's so silly. Uh, they don't take into account size, st uh, usefulness, what it's used for, that, nothing. Now, a bat wing and a horse leg, really? Really? Same thing? This is so stupid. Comparative anatomy, they say, provides further evidence of evolutionism. The commonality suggests that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. See? Bird, horse, human. How can you argue with that? Um, the, the problem is the bones develop from different genes in different organisms. They don't even develop from the same genes. They're not look alike. They're not the same size. They're a bat wing and a mole's leg. Please. Uh, but evolutionists can't explain this about bones developing from different genes. Similar design most likely provides evidence for a common designer. Designed life and used a certain method of, of for, uh, form model to do it. For instance, do you know Pontiac lug nuts will fit on a Chevy? Why is that? Why is that? Because they're built in the same factory. <laughs> of course, they don't need more. Uh, Pontiacs are extinct. It's kind of like uh, the T-Rex. The they found a, a Pontiac, though, that had uh, flexible DNA and soft tissue on the inside. So <clears throat> what they told you about the ancient Pontiacs may not be true. It may not have been that long ago. Comparative anatomy. Many animals have a somewhat similar forelimb structure. They might have had a common answer, most likely a common designer. This does not prove we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. Nothing that proves nothing. It's silly. It's silly. It's stupid. It's deceptive. Uh, here's another one. Embryology. How many of you would know what is meant if I say the recapitulation theory? What well, would you know what that was? Is? It's uh, still in textbooks, by the way. It says that 
after we are, say, uh, an egg, a fertilized egg inside our mother's womb, we, re, we go back through our evolutionary stages as we develop as an embryo, okay? Uh, see, see, like we have gills like a fish right there, see? See how that proves it. We came from a rock or we rearranged pond scum. Um, me back, you see, the embryos of each of these animals has tails and pouches during periods of their, of their development. Wow. Line number eight, these aren't gills, by the way. They're not gill slits. Uh, that's evidence from development. <clears throat> the similarity between early stages and the development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. See, early, uh, the similarity in their early development, he said that was the best. He, Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory was uh, embryonic development, similarities in embryonic development, the recapitulation theory, that we go back through these stages of evolutionary development in our embryo stages. Okay. Uh, by the way, in the human thing, those aren't gill slits, by the way. They for, form the bones in the ear. That's, that's what they really do. They have nothing to do with gill slits. Uh, they don't have anything to do with breathing at all, actually. Ernest Teckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's Origin of Species in 1860. <laughs> See, more circular reasoning. See. Darwin's best proof was Heckel's drawings. Heckel's biggest proof was Charles Darwin's book. So they just, uh, just patted each other on the back. <clears throat> um, you know, Heckel's drawings here, a dog and human, you couldn't hardly tell them apart. They are so similar in their embryonic stage. This is, I mean, it's rather amazing. Uh, there's a dog at five weeks and a man at five weeks, uh, it, it's really, it's, it's hard to tell. Look at them really, though. That's what they really look like. They're not some stupid drawing that some stupid fake scientist made up. They're not even similar in the embryonic stage. It's all lies, all pathetic lies. Look at that. Look what he drew that Here's what he did. Look at what he did. Heckel's famous set of 24 drawings purporting to show eight different embryos in three stages of development as published by him in Anthropogeny in Germany of 1874. Uh, that is the fish, the salamander, the, can't read that one. Oh, no wonder it's in German. <laughs> That's why they felt, spelled fish funny, F-I-S-C-H. Uh, okay, see how he, he drew all those the same up top in the early stages. Well, uh, and by the way, they used this in, our, in my kids' textbooks when they were in school. See the embryology nonsense? Here's what they really look like. Fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and human. Don't even look even a little bit alike. Completely, completely different in each case. <clears throat> A set of 19th century drawings that still appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says an embryologist in Britain. Although Heckel confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena, the drawings persist. That's the real mystery, says Richardson. I agree. That's the, new, that's the real mystery. Why are they still in books, textbooks? I'll tell you why. The stuff I'm showing you right here is all they have. That's all they have. The questions come up when we take them out. What are we going to put back in? Not my problem. Not my problem. Your problem. Look at this comparative embryology nonsense. All lies, fish, bird, human. Yeah, you can't tell the difference. <laughs> Whatever. <sighs> Chicken embryo, human embryo. See, it's, a, it's in all the books. It's all lies. Fakes, gill pouch. Uh, gill pouch, see, it's still pointing out a gill pouch, and they know it's a lie. But it's all they have. It's all they have. Pig and human can't tell the difference. Look at that. <clears throat> um, Tim Barris still teaching it 115 years after it was proven wrong. 
Kenneth Miller is still teaching it 125 years after it's proven wrong and shown to be fake. It's still in college textbooks. Well, look at there. It talks about the tail and gill pouches. Yeah, uh -huh, sure does. <clears throat> says by seven months, the fetus looks like the, on the outside, like a tiny, normal baby. But it's not. But it's not. Now, why would they say that? Well, you know what the answer is. Line number nine, it's not human. See, all these things lead up to, what, why are they even teaching all this? Two reasons. One, they, they want an existence without an Elohim. So they're not accountable to the, for anybody, for, for anything they do. And two, to justify baby killing. To justify killing babies. 34% of babies born in five and a half months survive. Well, that's back in 1998. Oh, my gosh. It'd probably double that by now. Samuel Alexander, a 21-week-old, less than five months baby, still in the womb, grabs the doctor's finger during surgery. That was famous back in the day, 25 years ago. And the angel of Yahweh said, Behold, you are with fetus and shalt bear a son. Genesis 16, verse 11. Oh, that's right. It said child, didn't it? Said child. <clears throat> Why? Oh, by the way, what does fetus mean? Where does it come from? The term. I've heard people. That's not a baby. That's a fetus. That's a Latin term. It just means little one. It's, it's the same thing. It's a baby. Why is this lie kept in the textbooks? It's the only way to scientifically justify abortion. Of course, human population's too high. And, and Yahweh Elohim said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly will you go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Dust you shall eat. Do snakes eat dust? No? Well, that's not their food. However, Satan does devour people. And what are, what are people? We're dust of the earth. That's what it's talking about. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. Yep. Uh, although my boots, they tend to see my boot, my shoe turned the other way around when I see a snake. I'm going away, by the way. Matthew 2.16, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof. From two years old and under. Uh, of course, once again, these are old numbers. In 1999, the population was 6 billion. Now it's right at 8 billion. Um, they think the world's overcrowded. A lot of people, you've heard that. Well, you can't, you have, we're way overpopulated. Uh, do you know that Jacksonville, Florida is land-wise the largest city in the United States? Area-wise. And did you know it can hold all the people in the world standing up. That's truth. Fit all the people in the world in Jacksonville, Florida. <clears throat> uh, and as a matter of fact, everyone would have four square feet to stand in. Hmm. Well, you know, <laughs> look at the land. Woo, there's, where do the people go? Where are all the people? You know, if it's overcrowded where you are, you can move. You really can. I mean, there's lots of Lots of land out there. Uh, this is fascinating. Planned Parenthood from October of 1952. This is their leaflet that they would hand out. Plan your children for health and happiness. Okay. Uh, what about birth control? It says, it asks, is it an abortion? And it says, no. An abortion kills the life of a baby after it's begun. Huh. That's what Planned Parenthood used to say back in 1952. Interesting, eh? Kind of changed that pamphlet, though didn't they? Oh, I like that. Ways to plan your children. <laughs> I highlighted that. Uh, what you want, uh, uh, you can have the number of babies you want and have them at the times when you and your husband are well and able to take care of them. Okay, I just thought that was an interesting take. But I bet it didn't say that anymore. <clears throat> oh, here we go. Here we go. When compared with the uh, the casement of a horse, the casement and appendix of humans is thought to be vestigial. 
vestigial, vestigial organs are those you don't need anymore, that we've evolved away from. We don't need those anymore. They, uh, we, they're, they're vestigial. They're you know, evolution themselves away to where they're not necessary now. Line number 10, there are no vestigial organs. Uh, long regarded as a vestigial organ with no function in the human body, the appendix is now thought to be one of the sites where immune responses are initiated. Its removal also increases a person's, person's susceptibility to leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, cancer of the colon, and cancer of the ovaries. There are no vestigial organs, ones that you just don't need anymore. Uh -uh. Everything you have, you need, you need, you need, you need. Even if there were some, that would be the opposite of evolutionism. And it's just something you don't need anymore. That's not adding, it's not making you more complex. Not making you more, well, you know, well then why do we have to have our wisdom teeth removed then? Huh? Why do we have to have our wisdom teeth removed? You don't want to know why? Because with today's diets, we no longer fully develop our jaw. So our jaw isn't big enough to handle the four extra molars. So we've got to get them pulled out. You know, we're too used to sandwiches and ice cream. We don't chew down on grain and uh, veg raw vegetables and things like that, which, you know, I'm guilty of that too, obviously. But it's still not evolutionism. Uh, they say humans have a tailbone that has no apparent use. Uh, there under the, uh, in the red, the vestigial tailbone in humans is homologous to the function tail. So we have that, they say it's like uh, we used to have a tail. Okay, that's what that tailbone is, is for because we used to have a tail. These vestigial structures can be viewed as evidence for evolution. Organisms having vestigial structures probably share a common ancestry with organisms, whatever. Um, so you've got a tailbone you don't need anymore. Uh, the coccyx, it has no present function. Okay. Well, not really. I remember uh, Christopher, when he was in college, he brought this up. His professor brought it up. That, uh, you don't need a tailbone, it's vestigial. And he raised his hand. Yeah. So well, my dad, his friend, said they'd pay to have yours removed if you want it removed, if you let us. And he uh, said, no, that's okay. The reason is the tailbone anchors nine muscles. These muscles help provide a <coughs> essential bodily functions. So do you need your tailbone? Depends. <laughs> Matthew 18, 6. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. I don't think this applies to, to terrible teaching. I think it's, this applies to child molestation that we see today that's just growing and exploding before our eyes. Any questions? That's the end of our lectures on evolutionism. Um, now, has, has, uh, ha has the field gotten more complex, found more evidences, more new things? No, no, no. However, they'll have new terminologies that they'll use to buffalo and bamboozle the people. That's it. But they have same smoke and mirrors, same lies, same forgeries, same nonsense. They got nothing. Absolutely nothing. Any thoughts? Okay. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the truth that you give us in your word, which, <clears throat> Father, we can see your truth all around us. We praise your name for that. We see proof, evidence and proof of you in nature, in biology and geology and <clears throat> and, and all the things that we, uh, that we see in the world. We pray, Father, that uh, the eyes of more people are open to, to you and your word, and we pray that you keep us, uh, draw us near to you, and continue to write your Torah on our hearts and minds. As we pray, as your humble servants, amen.